Welcome to uh, this session of uh, Painting Best Practices interviews with artists. And um, before we inter uh, interview our artist uh, and founder of the Epiphany Fine Arts School, um, Matt Miller, um, just have some uh, explanation. Some of you may not be familiar with Painting Best Practices. Uh, Painting Best Practices it was a full-on workshop that has been conducted since uh, 2013. We've taught thousands of students uh, about the best practices in painting. So it's, it's not a course about how to paint, but rather how to use the materials uh, from, from the support, from the preparation, the priming, all the way to the finish, varnishing, uh, how to use them properly, what kinds of materials, and the choices artists make and how they affect the longevity of their artwork. And that's really the key in painting best practices. Um, we also want to announce that uh, tomorrow, at, uh, on Sunday, Ju July 18th, at 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, we're going to be interviewing James Robinson, who is the founder of the Art Academy of St. Paul. And uh, James has a, a unique, perhaps although older approach to teaching, uh, teaching uh, both children and adults art. And his 30 years experience of teaching children, teens and adults, uh, he's gonna discuss how he applies in-depth understanding of the studio apprentice system of the late middle, uh, late middle ages and early Renaissance, and how this can streamline traditional teaching methods that produces extraordinary results. So now I'm gonna introduce uh, Matt Miller, who I said is founder of Epiphany Fine Art. And uh, we're gonna talk about how he works with the limited modern Zorn palette to make both colorful and visually balanced paintings. And uh, Matt attended the Painting Best Practices workshop as well as the six day workout and learned many of the principles that we've been teaching in these uh, workshops. And now it's a, it's a full on webinar on the paintingbestpractices.com. So let's uh, introduce now uh, Matt and uh, he can tell you what he's learned about that. Hi, George. Welcome Matt. Hi. And um, uh, Matt, uh, and I forgot uh, exactly when you, uh, I think it was uh, some years, probably was, um, four years ago, I think. 17, yeah, I think it was yeah. 2017. When, uh, yeah, when you attended a workshop and, um, and then of course in, I think it was uh, 2019, you attended uh, the workout here in uh, Northern California. Um, so maybe you can explain a little bit about what, uh, what were the major things that you took away, uh, both as an artist as well as, of course, uh, a teacher uh, of your own uh, from these, uh, these workshops? Well, I had spent uh, many years learning to paint from my teachers and practicing my art. And uh, I, several of the things that I had taken for granted that I was taught and used every day, uh, I later realized are problematic in the, uh, uh, or explain to me actually that are problematic in the uh, longevity of the paintings. Uh, for example, I use Marage exclusively as a medium and uh, uh, have since switched to oleogel as it has almost the same feel uh, as Marage. I actually like it better now. Um, I, I went back and tried to use a little Marage just to see what it felt like after several years of using uh, oleogel and I, I, I didn't like it anymore because um, I you know it, oleogel is simply you know it's 99 95 percent uh, linseed oil so it's mm -hmm. it's not going to damage your painting it doesn't have the uh, 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 resin resins, excuse resins me, and yeah <laughs> things like that dry, harden and crack um, I, I went to see a show at a museum not not, not that long ago uh, there were a, a lot of paintings painted by an artist that were done. It was an exclusive show of this artist, and they were all painted about 100 years ago. Almost every single one of them, it was almost impossible to see the painting through the cracks. Uh, uh, several of the uh, images of people were actually retouched by conser uh, uh, conservators to make it so that you could see the people. They had faded so badly. 
in a, in a room and the other uh, a separate room uh, down the hall there was a different artist that they had on pre, uh, presented that had painted their work in a circa 16 uh, 1610 and it was like it was painted yesterday it was almost flawless and clearly there was a difference in the way that the the, the artists was hand were handling the uh, materials. What I've learned from when I worked there, I have sw since switched to a solvent-free uh, studio. I'm almost 100% solvent-free. Um, it uh, uh, OMS doesn't touch my my board. It doesn't touch my it doesn't touch my easel, and it doesn't touch my brushes. And as a matter of fact, I found that eliminating uh, OMS uh, or turpentine not only is easier on my breathing. But it also is, uh, it makes my brushes last a lot longer. It was, mm -hmm. you know, we used to dry out the brushes and they would literally turn into, you know, uh, spread out and splay. Um, what are some of the other things that I, I took away from that? I, uh, I, fix, uh, uh, I, I fix an oiling out problem, which affects almost every artist that I know. In the beginning, by properly uh, uh, maintaining the materials, uh, properly preparing the boards, I, I tend to pray, uh, paint on boards. I prefer the hard surface. Um, I would recommend that if people paint on canvas, that they mount it on boards and paint on it that way. Uh, something else that came out away from that. Basically, we, we learned how to make it so that the paintings, uh, you mitigate all of the issues that are affecting paintings. Um, you know, over time, not just you know, the choice of materials and how you're mixing materials and how you're applying the materials, uh, you know, whether you're painting in layers or you're painting uh, you know, direct style like I do, uh, but also, uh, you know, how to prepare the panels or the, or the canvas, uh, you know, to best prevent the, uh, you know, acid, you know, causing problems or moisture causing problems. It never occurred to me that putting a hanging a, 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 a painting on a wall that happens to be an outside wall would impact the painting as opposed to painting hanging a painting on an inside wall it's from the moisture coming through the wall and through the back of the painting so we learned how to prepare the, uh, the frame and the canvas uh, you know to prevent that moisture to put a moisture block there um, you know and it, it was it was endless the changes to my uh, painting practices and one thing I want to make clear, actually, is I've heard a lot of artists say that they don't want to bother with materials because they don't want to impact their creativity. And I can tell you something, it doesn't impact your creativity. It just makes it so that your creative process can last longer. Mm -hmm. So that's my take on it. <laughs> uh, and just uh, for some individuals that may know, may not know what Marage medium is, uh, Marage is is a mixture of um, a mastic varnish, uh, turpentine, and black oil, which is actually oil that's been cooked with lead. And and although uh, the Marage, uh, what the medium was suggested by Jacques Marage, a conservator from uh, the Louvre in the middle of the uh, 20th century, it actually is uh, basically based on a McGilp that originated out of the 18th century, and so some of the some of the paintings we see from the uh, like Joshua Reynolds paintings from the 18th century and paintings after that that had this concoction, like uh, J. M. W. Turner, uh, and some of these other artists, like perhaps one of the artists you mentioned, may have had uh, resins or other things in there that that often result in very brittle paint films and then eventually cracking of that so and that's one of the things that that of course we discussed in 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 the workshop uh to uh to either avoid or at least limit greatly in in the paint film and uh matt were you originally painting on on stretched canvas did you i originally painted on stretched canvas but i had moved to board uh, uh quite a while earlier mm -hmm. and uh it, it wasn't until I, I moved to board because I just preferred the surface. I like a very smooth, solid surface. To paint mm -hmm. on. Um, and I later, you know, through my discussions with the painting best practices, you know, learned uh, how board, you know, and, and different types of board, whether it's natural board, how the board is cut, 
the uh, you know the, the, the way it's cut across the grain, uh, the type of wood, uh, hardboard versus uh, you know versus natural board. Uh, you know, and like I say, these days I paint almost exclusively on uh, aluminum composite uh, material uh, through artifacts uh, because I love the you know it's just very inert <laughs> and uh, it also helps prevent the moisture from getting through the, you know, to the painting. Um, another thing, by the way, I, I do want to mention uh, is that very strongly it has it was emphasized the impact of zinc on <laughs> oil paintings, and uh, there is no zinc in any of the paints that I use, uh, either as a mixture, as in a lot of I use lead white, and uh, a lot of the lead whites I was using that you can buy off the market that are called are typically called flake white these days are a mixture of zinc and uh, and lead. All right. And, um, it's one of the reasons I, I love lead, lead, lead white number one. I know what's in it, which is lead white. Um, and I also know that uh, the pigments that I buy through, uh, uh, through you guys don't have um, zinc in them, even in small quantities, as an additive that isn't mentioned anywhere on, uh, on the uh, 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 label. Right. So those yeah. Are, Go ahead, George. Yeah, no, I was going to say that uh, just along that line there, we know that uh, zinc was often used, maybe not even as, like you mentioned, as almost like an additive uh, because manufacturers understood that it did brighten uh, their colors when you squeeze them out of the tube. They, if you have two pigments and you add a little zinc to it, it did brighten it. It looked uh, much brighter, but for uh, for some of our viewers who don't or may not be familiar with zinc and what we've been taught what in paint your best practices we've been talking quite a bit about is um, is that zinc does cause embrittlement in uh, zinc white or zinc oxide causes embrittlement in oil paint films and uh, and this has really just come to light I mean this has actually been known for over a hundred years but but uh, has really been nailed down recently um, and and it's interesting that a lot of manufacturers are actually limiting either limiting the zinc white or actually eliminating it from their color line, and uh, so um, so it it, it appears to be a, a, like it is a real thing and and uh, a real concern. So another uh, another one uh, in issue the thing that I pulled away from the painting best practices is I use linseed oil predominantly in the uh, in the. Pigments, mixtures of pigments that I use. Uh, I had experimented with safflower oil, and I realized uh, some of the because a lot of people were talking about uh, how delicate it is, and all kinds of stories. And uh, yeah, I've heard you know out of that, I've heard some of the issues of uh, thick uh, impasto paints, which I do have in some of my passages, uh, literally weeping uh, years years after the paintings dry and sold. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, something I definitely want to avoid. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, now Matt has uh, Matt has prepared this video showing how he uses the Zorn palette. So I, I'm going to let Matt. I'm going to let you introduce the video, and it is 27 about 27 minutes long. And yes. um, um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce it, and then we'll uh, we'll go ahead and watch it then. Well, I had done this video uh, recently. I uh, did a full video. It's a three-hour end-to-end uh, video uh, detailing the process, uh, and I uh, took some salient parts out of it for this presentation that I thought would be interesting to people. Uh, I do believe I have about a 30-second a introduction in the beginning of the video. So Yeah, you do, actually, yeah. <laughs> so I'll just let it go ahead. I don't need to introduce it twice. Okay, we'll do that. Here we go. Hi, my name is Matt Miller from Epiphany Fine Art. I have been invited here by Natural Pigments to make this little demonstration about painting with the limited palette, in this case specifically the Zorn palette, or I, would sh I should say a modern version of the Zorn palette, which includes um, yellow ochre cad red light, which is a replacement for, uh, I believe, vermilion, which is what he used originally, uh, lead white, and ivory black. I'm using natural pigments paints, in which case they, uh, their name for ivory black is bone black, and I'm specifically using the lead white number one. I'm going to be going over some advantages and disadvantages 
and using the uh, uh, limited palette such as this uh, as we go through the presentation, including some ways to maximize its uh, you know uh, use and to get the most colorful feel out of the uh, colors that you can achieve with it. It's remarkable how many colors you can achieve but they're all relatively muted in most cases because of the fact that they're all mixed uh, with very limited colors much of them being uh, most of them being mixed with black black is the only blue that's available uh, there's a lot of blue and ivory black and uh, a, you know it, you can mix uh, you know bluish colors and greens and other colors with it uh, as I will be demonstrating just a little comment about the still life before I get started. I'm leading in on the left with a, uh, a muted blue vase and uh, some red, red and uh, dark red grapes, red orange grapes. The red orange grapes are, are filling in that little spot, uh, the dark there, and helping to lead into the main actor, which is this reddish greenish mottled uh, vase. And we finally come to a uh, climax point, if you wish, with the uh, orange, uh, the couple oranges and the little white flowers. Orange is one of the brightest colors you can achieve with this palette. The only yellow you have is uh, yellow ochre, which is an earth color, but in comparison to the other colors here, it can be appear very bright uh, by itself. Um, and as a result, the, orange, uh, the oranges at the climax point are a little bit of a pop. So let's get started with uh, with blocking in. Now let's get a sense here what I'm going to do. I think I want to come up right about here and right to about here. Matt, maybe um, we have a question there about uh, how did you tone that panel while we're watching this too. Bring this a little bit uh, further um, down. Actually, what I did was I uh, uh, just, a, I believe in this case, it was just a mixture of uh, some oleogel and uh, probably, I'm not even sure what colors I specifically used in this. I think I wanted it a little bit warmer. So I used, um, it might have been uh, a little yellow ochre and uh, and black, or I'm not even sure what I mixed uh, at this point. Uh, and uh, may have just been a little yellow ochre and uh, raw umber. I'm not sure. And then uh, you know, with a little oleo gel, you know, quickly smeared it onto the canvas and wiped it off with a paper towel. Uh, yeah. Lightly to get uh, just get a general tone in the background. And so, because a lot a lot of people, you know, they they. When they see toned canvases, they think automatically solvent, and nope. um, <laughs> and and so um, so it's always interesting uh, that, that people can actually do that. Um, and what was the approximate drying time? Uh, well, I often paint with it uh, while it's still wet, uh, but because uh, I actually like the effect of being able to make marks into the. Uh, 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 board, but if I if I do want to dry, I just leave it overnight. Great. Um, I know there's uh, I know you're commenting over this, uh, but uh, we can we can take some we can actually just do some of these questions unless this in the right place. You know, you put together a really lovely drawing and you get it very detailed. You're not going to want to mess with it or move it. You put a lot of effort into it. The same thing happens when you. Uh, even just you, you start painting, a lot of people will uh, start painting and get a lot of work done, get it all situated, and then look at it and say, eh, that's the wrong place. I'm not going to move it, it's too much difficulty. And I'm looking at this now and trying to decide if I like this location. 
There's a really good question out there right now, George, and that's about how to rinse out dirty brushes while painting without using OMS. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and talk about that? Um, I actually don't rinse out the brushes. I just tip, uh, tip the, uh, wipe the brush off if I need to get it clean with a, a, a paper towel. I, uh, uh, I find that um, I actually will paint a, a, sing a single painting, uh, almost an entire painting with one brush off the night with, uh, without uh, rinsing it out at any point in the process. The, uh, just simply wipe off the brush when you know, when I go from paint you know paint color to paint color, and then uh, you can get all kinds of really cool effects by how much pressure you put on the brush as you're applying the different colors in there. Yes, I we jumped to, to getting the background in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then at the end of the day, I just use some. Uh, uh, if I really have some colors that don't that don't work well with each other, if I'm painting a blue blue water and a, and, a, and yellow into something, and I don't want it to turn green, uh, I'll grab a separate brush for that. Uh, but uh, if, if predominantly, I just uh, uh, tip off the uh, the excess paint with my with the paper uh, paper towel. I and can flip as, back and forth to the audio, but. That um, that color mixture there is um, that's the cadmium red and that's cadmium red and a little bit of black, mm -hmm. uh, just to shade it down a little bit to bring it to bring its value in, uh, in line with the rest of the colors that I'm mixing with the green uh, the because uh, I'm mixing the, the yellow with the green to make a uh, the yellow excuse me with the black to make a green and I'm also mixing the white with the black to make a blue so to bring the uh, Cad red into the same value structure. I mixed it with the black to pull it down as well. Oh, that's mixing great. Mixing a, a touch of uh, white and um, you know uh, uh, just the cad red in there with a touch of blue, black actually, to get a sort of a purplish tone in this uh, at this point. Which I'm, I'm I'm saying all the same things on the, on the <laughs> demonstration, but. Uh, um, yeah, would it be accurate to think that Matt has studied with David LaFell? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I take it uh, Chris has uh, seen David. <laughs> and uh, uh, there was there was an earlier question. Do you usually start with shadows and darker tones? I start by framing in. Uh, often when I frame uh, when I get the basic gist of the location of things, I'll frame in the shadow marks. To give my sense, of, give myself a sense of where the uh, shadow acts as a boundary to light, and then I'll start working in the light. So I, I can't. I often do work that way, but it's not a hard and fast rule. So I'll go back to the. In here, we're trying to lighten up the uh, point where a highlight will naturally work across the or down the stem of the vase. And in a few seconds, I'll be putting in a actual highlight in the the first highlight in the object, right in the uh, concave point of the uh, stem. As we all know, highlights occur at any point where the object is uh, either at its absolute concave or convex point. That's where light accumulates. You lose color, and we see we perceive what we see as a white light or a white dot. And if we put those in the right spots, actually, I'm jumping into putting some uh, background color in here, or some dark uh, shading color in here. And uh, I'm going to be using uh, a very dark greenish color, just pulling in some of the uh, background as the uh, shadow color. And I'll be um, I speed I sped this up. Uh, as a, it's a little less important to just uh, would you like me to talk about shadow uh, color being put in? And again, I'm trying to condense you, George. it. Sure, if you'd like to talk about that, yeah. I mean, lead white number two, correct me if I'm wrong, George, is mixed with a uh, bodied oil. It's also actually take a it's actually, it's actually walnut oil. Into the shadow. Okay. Yeah. To, and it has a long, stringy uh, uh, feel to it. It's a very long paint. Lead white number one is a standard, uh, a more, uh, what I would call a more modern, uh, uh, shorter paint uh, that uh, 
uh, it, it, to me, it's the workhorse of the uh, uh, of the paints that I use. Where and um, you use you use both? Is that correct? I do. I use lead white number uh, two more in uh, when I want to when I want to be able to apply uh, uh, the paint in. Uh, uh, I don't know how to say it other than in a more you know stringy fashion. I want to be able to drag it out over the pan over the canvas rather than uh, uh, just apply it in small strokes. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's where that stringiness really works very well for that. And it's amazing that walnut oil, usually bought, you're, you were correct in saying, you know, bodied oil kind of makes stringy paint, but in this case with lead with walnut oil, tends to make it very stringy. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, it's, it's because uh, the lead reacts more with the linseed oil than it does with the walnut oil. So that in, in reacting, what I mean, it's, it's, it's forming soaps faster uh, or more readily than, let's say, walnut oil. Okay, that makes sense. So it's so with the walnut oil, the lead actually has you know, retains more of its uh, uh, pliability in, in that sense. Yes. Yeah. So I'll go back to the audio that here. Will actually help convince my eye of what I'm doing and keep the overall concept, you know, in my head. I mean, I need to see this thing looking, uh, the, the beauty of it starting to happen the entire time I'm working on it, rather than uh, working to some kind of middle space and putting in finishing touches only at the end. By continuously working towards the finish, I'm able to see the painting develop before my own eyes and to keep it fresh in my own mind, uh, which helps guide my hand and guide the process. We're going to put the stem in a crowd, I mean, excuse me, the uh, top of the stem and the opening. And you'll see I'm doing the same thing. I will be pushing the dark, pulling the two together, and then putting a highlight in there. Because at the top of the stem of the bottle, you're going to get another highlight. George, do you want to address the question that was recently asked about uh, whether the video will be available to watch again? Yes, this video will be available to watch. And more importantly, the full, is it three hour video, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So that will be available from um, Epiphany Fine Art. And, and I put the, uh, in the, in the comments of the um, YouTube video, I placed your um, uh, link there. Thank you. Along. A little bit of a warmer color going across there to bring out the light. Again, here we've just mixed a touch more of the uh, yellow into the uh, red to give it a little bit more of an orange tone. <coughs> and there goes that highlight. And then we're going to go back to working on the main body of the uh, vase. We've got the stem starting to look like something. was able to carve some of that background out to uh, uh, carve some of the stem out by putting the background in there to clean up any edges that uh, spill over. I find it's always a much stronger uh, painting when you can carve out of the background rather than paint the foreground. You'll have uh, cleaner strokes. I've been applying some of that green this is a green that's a mixture of nothing but uh, yellow ochre and black, which gives you that muted, uh, sagey kind of green color. And at this point, I'm just kind of pulling the two sides together to get a sense of the blend or uh, fading of the vase from one to the other color, as it is in the actual vase. Although I'm kind of, uh, again, just using that as a reference point through which I'm going to build this phase. One of the advantages of the Zorin palette 
uh, or any limited palette, is that it forces you to mix your colors and becomes, as a result, easier. It, it's kind of an, an aid to making your colors, uh, to, to pulling your values together. Once you have a million colors on your palette, artists can easily get led astray about the va uh, volume of colors they have, the number of colors, and uh, uh, have trouble keeping their values tight. So in uh, limiting the number of colors, you actually have a much easier process, in my mind, of keeping your values close together. And especially in this case, since most of these colors are being mixed with predominantly black to get the color that you want, the only color that you have here besides black, uh, the other two colors are an earth yellow, which is dim to begin with. It's, you know, it's not a vibrant color like cad yellow, and a cad red light, which is the most vibrant color on the palette. Now see how bright that yellow is in this context, surrounded by the other uh, colors. I'm mixing on the palette, uh, on the, excuse me, on the easel directly, um, mixing these paints uh, directly on the easel to uh, to pull them together. Much of this, uh, what I have been painting so far, has been very, very lightly feathered so that I don't mix the paints. So as I'm applying the paint, and you'll see me doing that again, as I'm applying the paint, I'm putting it on very, very lightly uh, with a featherweight touch so that I don't mix the colors that are from that I'm applying on the paint. You know, if I want red to lay over or the purple to lay over, I can apply it very lightly so that it doesn't mix. In the case of applying the yellow, I specifically wanted it to mix on the pal on the excuse me on the easel, so that I could bring the value down to where I wanted it to get to. And now I'm going to go back in and work some of these red and the yellow together to again get that feeling of the. Uh, uh, natural progression between the red and the yellow in, the, in this uh, particular vase. And here I'm barely touching the canvas. In this case it's actually a board. Uh, I'm painting on a, uh, I believe this is an aluminum board, also from, uh, from Artifacts, which is a company that's related to natural pigments, uh, an aluminum composite material board. So, Ollie, the uh, you know, asked the question of whether or not uh, where the focal point is in the painting. Ultimately, the focal point is, you know, the, the main actor of this painting to get this, is this vase, the big vase, and the, uh, with the other actors as uh, supporting, supporting it in the process. So, as far as uh, sharpening, you know, edging, you know, edges are a, uh, as has been said, the soul of a painting. So as you progress, some of the, uh, some of the edges in this will get uh, sharpened and some will get uh, uh, softened and some will get lost to make it, uh, hopefully to help the eye of the viewer uh, flow through the painting uh, better. Uh, Tanya asked the question if I uh, could tell you, uh, talk about the school for a bit. Uh, we started Epiphany Fine Arts as uh, yeah, yeah. we were planning on setting, uh, building a, uh, a, a physical in-person school, and then uh, we're kind of interrupted by this COVID thing. So we <laughs> we went online and decided to uh, to do everything online instead. So we've uh, we've gathered we're gathering a growing number of artists to uh, of all different mediums uh, to. Uh, basically work uh, by building a, a long series of videos, an ever-growing body of videos that <coughs> describe the aspect of the painting process in depth. Uh, I mean, one of the problems when you're reading a book uh, that somebody's written about painting is you can't ask a question. Uh, if they say something in, the, in three sentences, you either get it or you don't. Um, see what the beauty, beauty of that highlight does? point it really makes it pop and look round. Um, of course the yellow the, uh, a warmer color. So we decided to uh, build a school environment where people can watch videos at their own pace. Uh, and and it, we, we as teachers can attempt to answer the question multiple different ways because when you when I say X, Y, and Z is how you should do this for X reason, 
Uh, if you're not in the proper place to understand that at that point, you can miss that and really just not get it. But if, but with uh, the beauty of having multiple videos covering some of these subjects uh, in many different ways, is it gives the student the ability to see the same thing uh, in, in a way that suddenly it might the, the light goes on overhead and it, it clicks, and then you understand what's being said. Uh, so I'm uh, very, very excited about this and uh, really taking off and getting uh, uh, getting this process going. actually see it as a three-dimensional object. And interestingly enough, a multicolored three-dimensional object. I just jumped here to save time and move on to a different subject. I'd added the oranges and uh, the reflections into the bottle and, about, and the bottom, with the initial bottom piece, I had to tweak this a uh, little bit as we go on. I believe I go back and tweak the bottle a number of times to adjust its shape a little bit and clean up a few things. But I wanted to start working on and go over with you the um, blue vase. Now this blue color that's out here is, that I'm putting on here is black ivory black and white, nothing else. Uh, as uh, you probably have experienced, if you uh, use iv uh, ivory black, has a lot of blue in it, so that if you just mix it with white, it gives a bluish gray, very uh, uh, steel bluish gray. If you paint somebody's hair with this, uh, it tends to look, uh, if you're trying to paint a gray-haired person, you'll end up with a, a, a bottle blue-gray hair a color that is uh, very artificial looking. To actually turn this into a real gray, I would add uh, yellow ochre, uh, the, which will cancel out the blue and uh, turn it into uh, more of a real gray. But I just jumped here. I wanted to show you the um, the vase uh, as it's getting a little bit more developed. It, uh, it's actually a little long at this point. I cut it a little bit later. I realized I was, it, it had grown a little bit because this bottle is actually supposed to be behind and a little, a little in back of the uh, uh, big vase. But the couple, a couple of things that I'm doing to try and make the blue look more blue in this case. Uh, if you, you know, to make this look more blue, you want to surround it because it's, it's really a very dull gray color. You want to surround it with warm colors. Uh, I have the green bottle uh, next to it, green-yellow bottle next to it. Behind it we have a greenish background. And in a few minutes I'm going to be putting those red grapes in. The red grapes were uh, chosen in part because of the fact that uh, they're warmer, uh, a warmer color and they'll help bring out the blue quality in the, in the uh, gray. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want to uh, paint uh, blue eyes. I often use uh, just black and white to create this kind of gray color uh, because if you use real blue, you know, ivory, uh, excuse me, ultramarine blue or something like that in there, you end up, you tend to get eyes that look like they're uh, neon lasers uh, shooting at you. I use a very muted, uh, often just this gray, but you know, surrounded by all the warm flesh color, it makes it look very, very blue. Uh, we're just putting in some shadow here, and in a few minutes, it, or in a minute, it'll, uh, it'll uh, have a cut and fade into where I adjusted the bottle because uh, I want to get into the, uh, and pushed it back behind the uh, larger bottle. So I want to get the grapes in here before we finish to give you a sense of what that might do to the, uh, you know, how that affects the color of the blue. And uh, any second I'll be starting that, and we'll speed up to get that going because grapes are pretty straightforward in painting. Um, so start with a general mass, and uh, with uh, in this case being multicolored grapes, I'll try and get some of the rough colors in there, uh, getting a little of the shadow in behind it. and we'll block these Thank grapes you, in. The final painting, uh, I did expand on them and 
put in more grapes than uh, than are, will be in here by the time we stop. And of course, I put in the white flowers and uh, the rest of the uh, uh, cleaned up the rest of the painting. Now we've got. Uh, what do you notice about that, Tanya? I'm just basically giving a couple of edges really important is, without is, any is uh, real mass or shape or worrying uh, about the grapes. Just getting some basic there's colors the left, in there. The, uh, you, 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 there's uh, direct painting of the, uh, There's left and right that you can put the paint on the canvas, but there's also the depth and pressure that you put the paint on. And it's remarkable the, what, you, the, uh, what you can do by how delicately you can put the paint on the brush, on the canvas. Or next to this uh, uh, blue back bottle end. to enhance the blue bottle. Which I've sharp I'm going to start putting the highlights on. And again, like I mentioned earlier, point. it's the highlight points that bring out the three-dimensionality. It's one of the key components in making something look three-dimensional as long as you put the highlight in the right place. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start by... Uh, well, I hope that means I'm using it the correct highlights way. ...into this mass, <laughs> and that will uh, help create the illusion of... Uh, of individual grapes. As I place them in here, I'm not worrying at this point about how thick or gobby it is because I'm going to adjust that. And I eventually, by the way, do put a yes, lighter, I, I, you know, I it's a when surface use that the brush all the way up at the ferrule, see. and I always smack my students' hands about that. They can every one of them tell you. Uh, you're at that point. You're drawing. You're not painting. You know, you're, you're, there, there's a reason that the brush is, uh, as long as it is, uh, it, it gives you better control. It also gets you further away from the, uh, from the uh, painting so you can see what it looks like at a distance. Paintings were designed to be looked at at a, at a distance, not uh, uh, up close, like uh, drawings were. And, you know, uh, which is why many paintings you, you stand 20 feet away from them they, they scream at you how beautiful they are and you walk up to them and they fall apart the entire image collapses, and all you see is streaks and colors you have to get away from the painting to be able to see that as you're painting it put a little bit of a brighter orange on that uh top grape Again, so I wanted to make it a little bit more orange. I mean, what I'm doing when I'm manipulating the paint to, to adjust these uh, highlights, I'm, the brush is barely touching the canvas. I've seen people put highlights on grapes where they use a, uh, a chopstick or a, a, a skewer, a little. Um, shish kebab skewer and uh, it works uh, a, lot, a lot of times I've seen exactly the same Excellent. size dot <laughs> on all of the grapes I like to vary it a little bit uh, some of them in real life they're not usually all exactly the same brightness thank you very much for uh, joining me today I hope you found this to be a useful uh, demonstration if you did Please check us out at epiphanyfineart.com where we have a large library of artists' instructional materials that you can view at your own time and at your own pace. Thank you again. Beautiful job there. <laughs> and uh, great great to see just that going right through that whole painting. Uh, by the way, was that painted in three hours or was that... Uh... Uh, uh, two sessions that added up to about three hours, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, that's great. So, yeah, amazing work. Uh, really thank you thank for you. that. And um, um, we, you've talked a little bit about your school and um, your, your, your plans are, you're going to be, you're doing more online, but are you doing, going to be doing some like online mentoring? Um, yes, actually, that, that varies on the teacher, depending on the teacher who's in the class, who's teaching the particular class. I personally love, love working one-on-one -on -one with students and have, uh, you know, it is uh, an option to uh, have critiques of the student's work, uh, direct, you know, uh, critique, critiques that can be uh, scheduled. 
Um, we also have live videos, uh, live demonstrations uh, that uh, 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 people can see and discuss, just like we're doing now, and mm -hmm. have interaction while while the painting's happening. And as well as the canned videos that uh, uh, the growing library of canned videos and the uh, growing library of artists that uh, we're recruiting to work with us. Great. So, well, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, and thank you for sharing that video with us and uh, taking the time out uh, uh, from your busy move right now. <laughs> I just moved to a new house and, and, and a new studio simultaneously. Yeah. So but great. Thank you, George. Thank you for having me and inviting me to, to be here with you. Great. Well, th thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be doing more of this in, in the future. All right. Okay. Take care. Bye now.